I would like to welcome Professor Inge Kaul to the Graduate Institute, to our Global Health Program. Inge Kaul is adjunct professor at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. She's one of the leading experts on global public goods uh, in the international arena. And uh, before joining the Hertie School, she was the director of the office of the UN Development Report. Inge, could you share with us how you came to work on global public goods? How did that happen? First of all, thanks for the invitation to discuss. Um, how did it happen? Uh, it was uh, a very simple fact. And the fact is that more and more challenges that we are encountering in our daily life are transnational. They cut across national borders, they don't respect national borders. So I was traveling uh, to Asia and I realized the uh, problems with air pollution. I went uh, to other places and was concerned about my health because so many communicable diseases were around. So suddenly I thought, hmm, there is something that all these problems that we tend to discuss share in common and that is that they are transnational, that they hit all of us. And then I remembered the introductory course of public economics I had some time ago and I thought hmm, they, all these problems look like being public goods. They are not national public goods, but they are global public goods. And then we started developing a first book in 1999 to see whether this assumption that these phenomena share publicness together, global publicness, really holds. But uh, you did something else. You made reference to an economics course and many people when they speak of public goods or global public goods look at them purely through an economic lens. But you've put forward the challenge that we actually need to look at global public goods with a broader perspective. Could you say a bit about that? Yeah, uh, first of all, I should probably say when I use the term uh, good, it does not necessarily refer to something good. It refers to things that are in the public domain affecting mm -hmm. us all, sometimes for better and other times for worse. Now, when you think of today's public domain, you walk through crime and violence, you walk through climate change, you are being attacked by diseases, so what this tells us is that many of the things in the public domain are underprovided, and they present themselves as hurting our utility and well-being rather than uh, uh, adding to it. So therefore, uh, the uh, uh, next thought, of course, must be what can we do in order to better provide these goods? And according to standard economic theory, precisely if something is public, in the public mm -hmm. domain, we tend to free ride. I think hmm, maybe Ilona Kickbush will provide the traffic light. I wait for her, then I can enjoy it free of charge. And this same free riding behavior can be seen among states when it comes to global public goods. We wait, maybe someone else reduces greenhouse gas emissions, and then we in another state, uh, state don't have to undertake these reforms. So uh, there is a big policy challenge linked to uh, public goods and we have to see which ones contribute to our well-being, which ones hurt our well-being and in the latter case we have to take corrective action. You've introduced another term in that context because uh, as you've said not all countries might be similarly motivated to contribute to such collective goods so you've introduced the concept of smart sovereignty, saying that uh, countries should actually see how they benefit from collective action. Uh, what constitutes smart sovereignty? Uh, maybe I start with the problem that uh, before we come to the solution, smart sovereignty. At present, we are seeing so many underprovided global public goods. Think of financial volatility that we experienced during the last uh, years. Uh, and then states often say, oh, we can't do anything. This is globalization, the markets are so powerful and so. And uh, when one then points out that uh, markets are globalized, but politics still is very national, mm -hmm. 
then hmm, there is a hesitation often on the part of policy makers and they say, no, no, but I don't want to give up sovereignty. Now, this is a wrong notion, giving up sovereignty in policy areas of interdependence. If governments across the board were to join in regulating financial markets, we could control financial markets and set the rules so that markets serve us. If we were to cooperate in terms of controlling diseases, we could better fight these uh, diseases. So it is um, a sovereignty paradox, as I call it, that brings about the problem. States trying to hold on to their sovereignty and in the process losing sovereignty. And uh, in policy areas where you face these global public goods, it is smart to say, no, I cannot achieve financial stability on my own. I have to collaborate with all the other states and then I save the costs, the very high costs of crisis. And crises are often more expensive than the corrective action. So therefore I coined this uh, phrase smart sovereignty to point out to policy makers that there are some areas of course where states also compete with one another to attract capital and so on. But there are other areas in which it is very smart and in our self-interest, enlightened self-interest, to cooperate. And that is the um, uh, message I'm trying to get across with the term smart sovereignty. Thank you very much, Inge, and thank you for coming to our event uh, later this morning, where we will be discussing some of these things. The issue of R&D for Health is, uh, of course, being discussed also at the World Health Assembly in May of this year and we hope that uh, with your ideas and your contribution we'll be able to take the discussion one step further. Thanks yeah. a lot. Thank you very much. Thanks.